da, 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 da. Okay. <clears throat> hey, Larry. <laughs> Hello, Ricky. At long last. At long last. And thank you for your <laughs> English accent on my uh, <laughs> in tribute to my heritage. The uh, I have wanted to speak to you for a very, very, very long time. Uh, not only because now we're uh, at Team Angelica, we are publishing your fantastic book, but also because I read, was it your first book? Was Blackbird your first book? Blackbird is my second book. What was your first book? Eight Days a Week was my first book. Oh, yeah, yeah. I read Eight Days a Week. And um, so I read your, I, as, as since reading that, I don't know when that would have been. What year was the publish? What was the year was the publishing date? For uh, Blackbird or Eight Days? Eight Days. 1985. Uh, I read it then. And, um, and like, mm, I'm going to say, well, let's just say countless young uh, gay kids. Um, and, you know, I buy, you know, 20s. Uh, and under, everybody was reading that book, um, black and white, but of course, black kids were like, this is, this is this, there's this, there's this. And, um, and it was joyful and it was sassy and it was um, romantic and it was um, sweet and sexy and music was a guiding principle. Um, and it was honest about being, you know, a young black kid that doesn't fit into all the black moles, but is still very much a black kid and, um, and honest about attractions between black and white and all of those things. Oh, you know what it was. You, uh, you knew what you were doing. You knew that what you were doing, right, was placing something in the world that you needed to read yourself and hadn't been there. Am I right? Or That's exactly right. It was... Um... It was a direct reaction to Gordon Merrick's The Lord Won't Mind, which is the whitest book ever. And I was in my early 20s recently out reading this book, which was, of course, a huge runaway bestseller. And it was the book that every gay man had and was reading and was talking about and blah, blah, blah. And I read it. And my overwhelming reaction to it was disappointment um, because the only black character in it was the maid who actually says the Lord won't mind. And the cliche though, though it is, I've said it to many people since, write the book you'd want to read. And since I really wanted to read about a black gay character who was more like me, I created a black gay character who was me. And that's, and that's how um, uh, Eight Days a Week happened. And that's when Johnny Ray Russo became a character. An iconic um, character, I might add. I'm sorry, say again? An iconic character. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you don't think so? I think... <laughs> Uh, you know, I was just telling. Just I'm glad. I'm. I'm happy you think. I'm. I'm happy you think he is. I still consider myself a relatively obscure writer, so it's difficult to accept the term iconic about anything about me or my work. When I think most people still have no idea who I am. So if he's important to you, then he's important. I feel good about that. Um, I think, but just to hear you say things like, well, everybody was reading that book and all the kids were talking about it. I had no idea that there was a time and place where a lot of people were reading that book. I really, I really didn't. So that's, that's actually, that's new, that's new news for me. Well, I believe that you could be iconic even if there's an audience of just one yourself. I believe that when you, if you, if you hit a space where you are the defining, governing, pioneering principle of something that's iconic. And so I understand that it's very difficult to claim for yourself or your own work because it lives in the, it lives, you've given it away to the world and then they have to decide whether it's iconic or not. I get that. But some people know they're iconic. Diana Ross? <laughs> 
Diana Ross knew she was being iconic. She knew. And, um, and, and I think there are many people, many artists who Van Gogh or Van Gogh or Van Gogh or, Van Gogh or whichever way you pronounce it, Van Gogh, you, you read his letters, he knew he was iconic. He knew the work was iconic. It was what he was striving for and he, and he knew. But I understand that sometimes we don't know. And, um, but the, I can tell you now, I mean, the name, Johnny Ray Rousseau, I mean, that's an iconic name. And, uh, the, and, the, and you chose iconic titles for the books. Uh, you chose Beatles titles for the series of books. And uh, so there well, was- I'm ter Well, that was, that was purely practical. I'm terrible at titles. Movies that made me gay is really the only yeah. one of my book titles that I thought that's catchy. That's a good title, boy. I'm glad I thought of that. The rest of them were just um, desperation because I would have this finished manuscript and think, well, I've got to call it something. Um, and because, as you've um, obviously noticed and you've mentioned, pop music is such a driving force in my life that naming my books after songs was almost the only choice. So, you know, I had two, two Beatles songs, a Bob Dylan song, a Joni Mitchell, Janet Jackson song, and uh, uh, Captain Swing, which is the name of an album by uh, Michelle shocked, and and really, it, it it it's they were almost. I like the way it sounded. I mean, there's they're, they're not they're they're no deeper than that. They're just like okay, I like the way that sounds. I'm going to use that because I'm just not good at titles. I'm going to claim uh, a black gay stereotype and say we know iconic. We know iconic, <laughs> and we and and. and Every, you know, gay black teen, or not every, but most gay black teens are sitting there and they are attracted to the iconic, the iconic performer, the iconic song, the iconic album, the iconic outfit, the iconic lyric, the iconic movie, the iconic piece of art, the iconic moment, you know, and um, the, <laughs> that's how we reclaim our space that, you know, when people try and edge us out, that's how we get, we create a universe. We create, we do a series of big bands. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I think Johnny Ray does that. Like he sees things happening, iconic <clears throat> love, the boy, the song, the moment, the friend. He's, you know, as teenagers, I think all teenagers, I'm gonna spread it out. All teenagers are looking for iconic points of view, moments. And uh, so your instincts were very, uh, I think very clearly towards the iconic, if not trying to claim that for yourself. Um, but I can tell you now that book was iconic to me. And when I got, and we will talk about it in a while, but when I got the opportunity to be the, you know, one of the screenwriters of the adaptation of one of your books, I could, it, it was iconic for me. That was, the, you know, it's an iconic book. Who's saying no to that? But we'll talk about that in a bit. But I want to ask, find out more about you, the uh, uh, little Larry. Um, this is his first book, um, and it, 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 was it the, was it your first attempt at a book? My first attempt, my first attempt at a book was um, a straight genre romance novel that I wrote first because someone told me that one could make a living writing those. And because of, because I wrote it in 1983, 84, back in the days of five inch floppy disks, it doesn't exist anymore because it was stored on something that failed. And I do know that some of the, there are aspects of it, there are parts of it, there are chunks of it that I managed to work into eight days a week. But what happened was 
I discovered that I didn't have the proper uh, sensibility for that genre. Um, I, I think hard as I tried, and I did try, I couldn't quite take it entirely seriously. And I got some of the best rejection letters anybody could ever hope for because these, these lady publishers and editors would read this manuscript and go, I laughed, it was fun, it's not quite genre. And I think the problem was that my sensibility was just too gay, that you couldn't, I couldn't take my tongue entirely out of my cheek, uh, even though I thought I had. So um, Eight Days a Week was actually my second attempt at a book. And I really almost wrote Blackbird and Eight Days a Week as one sweeping epic Inside. novel and um, ended up taking 300 some odd pages of the chunk about his 20s and his first big love and the the show business aspect of it and making that the first novel. Aha. Uh -huh. So what was the title of the lost novel? Uh, the, 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 the romance, I believe it was called Funny Valentine. And I think the 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 girl's name was Edith with a Y T H E Edith Valentine, and she was uh, a comedian. And she's based on a friend who who's still a friend of mine, um, who was a, a a lady comedian impressionist. So yeah, I'm pretty sure it was called Funny Valentine. Edith Valentine, the another iconic name. It just naturally comes naturally to you. Funny Valentine is really good. That's really good. Um, so, uh, rejection letters, and then did you sit around feeling sad about it for a while and then write, or did you, how, what was then, how did you make the mental leap from rejection to completion of a novel? The, the, the Harlequin romance was a whim. And when it turned out that that wasn't going to be my path to quitting my day gig it, it i don't you know and this was this was 40 years ago um but in in hindsight i don't recall being particularly hurt by it especially since as i said almost everyone said this was really fun so the fact that i wasn't going to become this uh lucrative writer of of ladies bodice strippers wasn't a big deal it wasn't what i wanted to do artistically anyway um, so as I said, I, I took what I could from that manuscript and weaved it into uh, eight days a week and 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 move and moved forward. And that book was meant for um, Michael Denany at St. Martin's because they were publishing all of the serious gay literature at that time. And so that was my, that was my dream publishing house at that time. Okay. Um, so I had a goal. I mean, I literally, I mean, I, I was working at the graduate library at UCLA at that time. So I had access to every book published. And so I was able to, and of course, at that point, one could read every gay book published in any given year. We're talking 1982, 83, 84. Um, and so I read all of the books that uh, Michael Denany was uh, editing and publishing at that point. And I sent him eight days a week and he too rejected, and he rejected it. And it again was a very kind, helpful rejection letter. Um, he said, um, this was fun, which kind of seems to be a <laughs> ongoing theme. Uh, he said, this was fun, but nothing much really happens in it. Um, but I think if you send it to Sasha Allison at Allison Publications in Boston, he might be interested in it. And I did that and he was interested in it. And that's how Sasha Allison at Allison Publications in Boston ended up publishing eight days a week. He thought it was wonderful um, and, uh, and he published it. It sounds like a, a, a hookup, the, the disastrous hookup. You, you a little bit actually. So um, no, you so... were fun. <laughs> you were fun, but nothing really happened for me. 
<laughs> yeah. I think, I think my yeah. friend would be interested in dating you. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> and 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 Sasha was interested in dating me. But I told Sasha Allison, even as he said, I want to publish your book. And I said, thank you. That would be great. I said, but my dream publisher is still St. Martin's Press. And I'm going to send them my next book first. So you need to know that going in. And he understood that. That was St. Martin's is where you wanted to be if you were a American gay novelist. And so he understood that completely. So when I finished Blackbird, I sent it to Michael Denony, thinking I have an in at this publishing house and he's going to remember me from eight days a week, you know, and oh, what a good boy am I. <clears throat> and after he accepted it, I said, and of course you remember I sent you my first novel. He said, no, no, I don't. I, uh, and you know, I had no idea. What do I know about these things? He says, I, he said, all of the books I read in any given week. No, I don't remember your first novel. I saw this novel and, and I liked it. Ah, and do you feel like it was the right place for you once you moved, changed publishers? It was, and when I say it was my dream publisher, I am not exaggerating. It was, it, it, I, made, I made a dream of mine come true. So that was great. Um, the good news was that I was with a big New York publishing house. The bad news was I was with a big New York publishing house. So they really didn't do an awful lot for the book, except that because it was from St. Martin's, the gay press, at least, immediately got wind of it and it was reviewed everywhere. And everyone, you know, everyone knew about it in terms of in terms of the gay, gay literati. And because of what it was, as you know, it is acknowledged as the first modern black gay coming out story. And so because of that, there was some interest in it. Um, it didn't sell a lot of books. It just plain didn't sell a lot of books. It got a certain amount of attention in the press, in the gay press, um, you know, good and bad. Um, there were, of course, black people who thought it wasn't black enough. Um, but it's still the book that people know about if they know about me at all. Um, part of that is due to the movie and part of that is due to the book. Um, but it never moved a lot of product. I mean, I think the same 5,000 copies are still floating around and people are still you know, buying it on Amazon and then selling it back. Well, I bought it, and um, and and John bought it. Who um, is you know was your hands-on editor for this? Um, it was part of what bonded us. Because John and I, I don't know if you know this, we went out with each other for eight years when we first met. When we were, uh, he was twenty-three, I was twenty-six, and um, and part of that I was, wondered, was but when I didn't this know, book. and I never asked. I often wondered, oh, do these two have a past? But I didn't, I could never find a tasteful way of asking him. Well, here's my not so tasteful way of, of throwing it into this conversation. You know, but who wouldn't boast about going out with John? You know, he's the most amazing person. And, but part of what um, bonded us was, have you read this book? Oh yeah, I've read this book. Because John, of course, lives and breeds books, as do I. And did, did you, did you grow up as a, a bookworm? A book well, oh, yes, absolutely. Book I mean, at the same time that I was a, I guess, movie worm and record worm, I was certainly a bookworm. Um, <clears throat> you know, as 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 I mentioned in in movies that uh, movies that made me gay, um, I I tended towards things that I was much too young for. I think I was ten when I read The Valley of the Dolls the first time and understood about half of it. <laughs> but yeah, I. I, I think I was two and a half or something when I learned how to read. Um, so yes, I was, I was a bookworm. He was like, well, what were you reading? Literally everything. If it had, if it had a cover on it, I'd pick it up and I'd read it. Um, which I think is why I don't really have big influences to point at because I read everything. I hear that. I hear that. Exactly the same story for me started very young reading and um, immediately wanted to be a writer. When did you know that you wanted to be a writer? I'm, and I knew then, as soon as I started reading, 
And then I, when I was seven, I decided plays, films, book, you know, books that move, books that, that 3D books. That's what I went to. But um, when did you know you were going to be uh, a, a writer? I still have trouble thinking, thinking of myself as a writer because I really just, I sort of dabbled in it. I mean, I've been a published writer for 40 years, but I've published now six books. That's not a lot of, out, a lot of output. And the reason for that is that writing was never what I set out to do. I was supposed to be, I, he's going to sue me eventually if he, when he hears about this, but my line is I was Billy Porter when Billy Porter was in elementary school. I was supposed to be a singing star. I was supposed to be the black gay male out fabulous singer. Um, and I was good. There are still people left alive who remember me when I was a singer. And that's what I was going to do. That was my dream. Writing was not my dream. Um, I was supposed to be a singing star. And the world wasn't ready for a black gay male diva in 1979-80, which is when I started. So, but the pursuit of that was such that it was harming my primary love relationship. So I had that to deal with. Um, so I banged my head against that wall for a good seven years, really had kind of plateaued at this lower echelon of show business. I was doing little clubs and I was doing little cabaret and I was in a little jazz vocal group, um, that was doing little clubs and little cabarets. And, um, and Greg finally said, and he's, to this day, he's he's my biggest fan. He said, you know, I'm your biggest fan and I know I'm the one who told you to, you know, poop or get off the pot. But the fact is, this isn't working anymore. I, I need somebody who's going to be home, who's going to have dinner with me at six o'clock and who's gonna to go to bed with me at 10 o'clock. And so I had, a, I had a choice to make and it wasn't an easy choice, but this was 1982, three, and there was a man who wanted to have a household with me, who wanted to be my family. And I thought, well, here I have this aha singing career that's going nowhere. Um, and I also have a man who wants to be my family. So I decided that I was going to um, jettison the show business dream, but the fact is, and this will come as a huge surprise to you, I know, I'm a big show off. I'm not the kid who writes in a journal and puts it away. If I write something, I'm writing it because I want people to see it. I'm the kid who says, look what I did, um, be it you know, singing or writing or whatever, or, or drawing, all of which I've done. I never did it just to do it because I'm a show off. So it took me a matter of weeks before I realized, okay, you're not going to be singing, but you've got to do something. And I had a degree in English Lit from UCLA. So I knew I could make words and sentences and paragraphs and pages. And so it was a matter of, well, what, what am I going to write? And so that's how I came to writing. I came to writing after years as an entertainer. So I still consider myself primarily a singer because it's the one thing I do best. And I consider myself an entertainer. And when you look at my books as you have, this might be another slant that you haven't taken, you will realize that they're all monologues. Yeah, I realize that. So, because that's what I am. I'm, I'm an entertainer. All first person, they're all, um, I, they're all internal. Um, mm -hmm. the main character. Uh, that's, that's, do you feel, how do you feel now when you look at Billy Porter and Lil Nas X and, you know, and the, you know, how do you feel now looking at them? Oh, I'm, I'm joyous to live in a world 
where Billy Porter and Lil Nas X can be major crossover superstars. And I'm hugely jealous that it wasn't me. So it's a mixed bag. Um, I'm glad it got here. Um, do I think I was as good as Billy Porter is? Yeah, I do. So yeah, I'm, you know, am I bitter? Yeah, a little bit. But there's, you know, there's nothing you can do about time when it was. Um, you know, I was trying to do this 40 years ago and the world wasn't ready. There's nothing I can do about that. That's why you've got a husband and I haven't, I think. <laughs> well, there's that. I also, you know, I also do realize that I, I might not have a 47 year relationship if I had continued to pursue show business long enough for the world to catch up. Right, which, Who is, knows? A time, which is a long time. These people have spoken to recently, not back then. The, uh, I mean, but you know, it ain't over till it's over, to quote another song title. Well, you know, I haven't, it's not like I ever stopped singing, you know? I've always been singing in, you know, in church and in, uh, in, in, in little groups and, in, you know, in this and in that. And, you know, there are, you know, there are YouTube videos of me singing from this year. So, so it's not like I ever stopped singing. I simply stopped trying to pursue it as a career. And, you know, and I, and I never really pursued writing as a career because I knew I was writing minority of minority art. And that was just never going to support me financially to have a level of creature comfort that frankly, I like. So I'm a career secretary. That's what I did for 40 years. I yeah, worked for attorneys because there, there was money in it. Um, and now I'm, you know, I'm almost 67 years old and I'm comfortably retired and I like it. I like it a lot. So, you know, I don't want it thought that I have regrets because I don't believe in regret. I presume you Either, were a great legal sec. You were legal secretary, is that what you said? I was. No, <laughs> I was a good legal secretary. A great secretary actually gives a fuck. Um, I was a really good legal secretary because I aced that work. But I, but come five o'clock, I didn't give a shit about that. Um, and that's the difference between a good secretary and a, a great secretary. I knew secretaries who were literally on call 24 seven. And I wasn't one of those. I worked a shift and I was great for those eight hours. And then I went home to my husband. So that's so you, why I wasn't a great secretary. You think you're a great lover? I don't mean, I'm not talking about sex here. And, uh, uh, yes. And I actually think I could call my husband in here and, and, and he'd agree wholeheartedly with you, uh, with, with me. I'm a, I'm a very, I'm a very good lover now. I haven't always been, I don't think, but I've learned to be much less selfish than I than than I used to be. When I was younger, it was it was kind of all about me, me, me. Um, but um, I'm very supportive of my husband. I'm very, yeah, I'm good. I'm good to him, and 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 he'd agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> And you still, you, you, as you say, you're a show off and you still make art. I mean, the reason I begged you to, to write this book is because what I saw, I mean, I'm not on social media that much. I'm on all, I'm on all the social medias, but I don't, I, you know, I don't, you know, you have the scrolling moments, you know, and you're there for a while, but I don't really get into, I'm busy making work. I was going to say, you don't have time. <laughs> you're, directing, you're directing operas. I'm, doing, I'm busy. I'm busy, but I, I, you know, I keep an eye on the things I keep an eye on. And, the, and I was absolutely, and, which is my friends, you know, including my Facebook friends, some of whom I've never met. You know, I, that group, I'm looking at it. And, um, and I'm not there to be, you know, pounced on by QAnon or whatever. 
But the um, but uh, to me, I just realised that I was consuming your your social media the way I would consumed your work. You know that it was something to look forward to, and something to be provoked by, and something to be amused by, and um, and something to be um, challenged by, and something to connect with. It just felt like you were you were doing a Dickens thing. You know, you were writing these episodic moments, and that's why I, I just became obvious to me that you should. And I don't think I was the only one. I wasn't the only one who said these should be in a book, was I? Actually, you were. Um, which, and sometimes it's amazing how it just takes a particular pair of outside eyes to make you see something. Because, and, in, and it's, it's in the book. The fact is I had tried a memoir with pop music as its, as its hook, which seemed the most obvious to me you know as a singer and a lover of 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 records and blah 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 blah, and it just it just died on the vine it it had no forward momentum at all and i had put it aside was you know knitting a good deal i guess at that point and it never occurred to me one to do movies and it certainly never, and it's because it's because of the way you said it and where you said it, because it was on a post about an old movie, and you said, "Can we please compile these into a book?" And that was it. That was the key, because I had never thought of it. And that day, I started looking through my own Facebook posts and going, "How did I not see this?" But I hadn't. Ah. And you did. Well, and I started working on that book that day. We didn't even have a contract. I was, I had written the first big chunk of it before we'd signed a contract. That's true. I was that, I was, I was that enthused by it. And the project had that much forward momentum. And I know that neither you nor John was sure it was going to work until I sent you that first oh, 65 I was sure. or whatever pages. I was sure. And no, and, I, and I'll tell you why you weren't, because until the two of you saw the draft of the table of contents and you saw what the rest of the book was going to be, and you both went, oh, yeah, okay, I can yeah, see I, where this is going to go now. You're right, because, of course, I thought it was going to be about generally your opinions on culture. And then you went, you, I think, said, no, I need to narrow it down to films first. Because um, I wanted it just right. to do everything. Because what you said was going to be three or four books minimum. <laughs> True. And I was excited because I thought, okay, there's three or four books then. So there's going to be the movie book. There's probably going to be the music book. I think that's, you know, I know it's a lot of work, so we'll see what happens. But that seems to be, you know, brainer. Then there's the book book and, you know, and so on. And there's the TV book. I mean, there's so much because you do love culture. And you do, uh, you're highly opinionated about your, about culture. <laughs> and, uh, and the, um, which is exciting to read. And I don't like reading criti critics. I, 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 I don't read reviews of any of my work. I try to avoid reviews of other people. So sometimes it's hard to, am I the only one who thinks this? Then you think, yeah, you, I have a peek at the reviews. But I'm much more interested in audience reviews. And the, um, which is, you know, why Amazon is great, because you can get to see what people who are not paid to have opinions think about things. Um, so the, it, 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 but your voice is so you, and it's so, you don't pretend to be somebody else's, even though you're very like, this is how I see it, this is how it is for me, don't argue with me, it's your thing. You know, I never argue taste is your, is, is your, is your, uh, your, uh, your, your, your. It is, it is my motto. But <laughs> the difference, but that's the difference between being a critic and being a movie fan. Another, one of the interviews I've done recently, she actually asked me, so are you a film critic? And I said, no, I'm not a film critic. I'm a movie fan. And that's the difference. I'm not trying to tell you what you should like. I'm just telling you what I like. And that's a big difference. Which I think actually critics should do. You know, I respect critics. I have friends who are critics. Um, but that's what I feel. I think what, it's all important to be honest. I think we need more critics that say things like, 
I'm not a teenage girl, so I don't, I, I'm not the ideal person to discuss Angus songs and snogging, you know. Uh, I think that's very important that some, some, that some, somebody who's so totally different from the, the target demographic um, needs to admit that, you know, and, uh, and often the critics can't, they don't go and see movies with other people. So they can't say, well, it was really, everyone was laughing around me because they're the only one in the theatre when they watch it and so on and so forth. So I just think more, I, I, I'm much more interested in individual opinions, which includes critics. Some critics are brilliantly honest about that. And, um, and then they're the ones worth reading. They're the ones who put themselves, who have humble enough to put themselves in a context rather than um, trying to be, you know, th that pressure to be the voice of God about something. And, and you're, you're great at that. You say, well, people liked it, but I didn't. And then you are, and you'll say, um, everybody hated it, but I loved it. In fact, I know it's terrible, but I love watching it. And that, that's how we really experience stuff. We know that this is a piece of shit, but we, we love it. I, you know, you know, that's it. Uh, I know that Mahogany is not Citizen Kane, but I could watch it a hundred times more. I've never seen it. It's on my Oh own. my God. I've well, never seen it. to do another book just so that you can watch it. Mahogany is everything, Larry. It's everything. <laughs> it's everything. I've just, it, it, it's Dinah Ross and it's Dinah Ross. And, <laughs> and it's Dinah Ross. And everything that's, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's just a wonderful, it's, it's Anthony Perkins doing, and doing what he can do better than anyone else. You have to see it. I don't want to say anymore because I'll spoil it. I told you it's, a, it's, it's on my list. It, it, it has I'll to get be. To it. I never it had has to, to it. Be. At the time I wasn't, I was, I wasn't interested at the time and I don't know why. And I just never, I never caught up with it. I know. And I think it's, is it is it a truly bad movie? No. In, in in initial caps. No, it's not a bad movie. It's it's not a bad movie. It's not. It's, I, I for me, it's not Valley of the Dolls, which is a bad movie, but I loved it. Yeah, a truly I mean, bad movie. It. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, as I say in the book, there is there is a place in the world for initial caps, truly bad movie, and but to me, a truly bad movie is. You know, big stars, lots of money, should have worked. They really mentioned it at the time, and somehow it's so bad that we can't not watch it. Um, and so I kind of thought maybe Mahogany was one of those, but you're saying no, it's not. Possibly it is. I just connected with it so much. The, it, 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 it's certainly not as good as Lady Sings the Blues, which, you know, has its problems, but is a, a really well-made movie. And um, whereas Mahogany is, it's bitty. They changed directors mid mid get mid canter, um, and you know it's a it, it's it's a romance novel. It's a romance novel. It is okay. girl meets boy, boy girl loses. You know, girl bright lights, Rome modeling, fashion design. It's set in a superficial world, um, but it's set. You know, she's from the she's from the the the, the south side of, of Detroit. It's it's got. I, I, I don't want to spoil it. I, 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 we could All right. whole. We'll revisit this after I've watched. Literally, I think we should do one of these conversations just about mahogany. <laughs> All right, I'll let you know when I do that. You know, when we, when um, you know, us, the movie um, that followed uh, uh, Jordan Peele's movie that followed the iconic Get Out. Get Out. Uh, uh, us is. You know, a, a film that I had complicated feelings about while watching it. And then when it finished, I had these, still had these complicated feelings. And then I kind of hit the street and a bunch of friends were out on the street. And we were all talking about it. And I realized I'd watched something quite extraordinary. And, um, but my friends, all, we all felt so differently. So we had a party. I had, had a party at my house and we showed us and we, and we went through it. Together, it took us about five and a half hours to watch it because we were stopping and debating. Oh and arguing. It was great fun. Everyone had the best time and lots of food, of course. And just that some movies can, a, a great conversation, you know, and, um, and that's a thing. That's the thing. So we should, maybe we should do a bunch of these taking particular movies 
and then just gonna, you know, fighting. I mean, it's fun, right? And the, we do the same thing with Black with Black is King as well. The um, the Beyonce, uh, Lion King album visual. We had a big party and stopped it and talked about what are, what is she saying here? What what are we getting? Why do we like this? Why don't we? It was you know, there's certain things that you there's conversation pieces, and I think mahogany, in in all its apparent superficiality, is has a lot to say, but. But then you, re- I think you'll see that because that's what your book's about, how you're seeing a different movie sometimes from other people, would you say? Well. It's coming to you through the filter of Larry's history because you know about this and you enjoy I'm trying to think of who's, I'm trying to think of who I'm about to quote. It's, 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 from, this, it's from the Celluloid Closet documentary. Oh, it's from the screenwriter, the man who wrote um, Rebel Without a Cause because um, we all think that the Salminio character is gay. But the screenwriter who wrote the character says, no, that's not what was in his mind. And he said, and I say this all the time now, no two people ever see the same movie. And that's what I think. No two people ever see the same movie. But, I mean, uh, well, there's a, uh, uh, as well as the screenwriter, what's his name, Lawrence something? Or Rebel Without a Cause? What you have there is a movie with James Dean and Salminio and um, uh, the, uh, Nicholas Ray, the director of Rebel Without a Cause. It's a queer triumvirate of people making a movie. And, um, and so they're, they're in, well, like, in, like as is also discussed in the celluloid closet, sometimes you're, you're, you're leaving Easter eggs in movies. And um, and it's 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 impossible not to see it in Rebel Without a Cause, in my opinion. Um, but then you know, again, we should do a whole we should do a whole conversation an hour talking about Rebel Without a Cause because yeah, I could that 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 would be easy to do. And, and interestingly, I young actors, one actor in particular uh, that I worked with, um, I worked with a lot. He said he did this thing of it's time to go through the iconic movies that people talk about and so started watching them all and he was stunned by Rebel Without a Cause and not in a good way he was really like the acting so over the top and he was, he was you know doing James Dean's acting and you know oh I think of it as an opera yes they're not singing but it really it's 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 opera right everything is big. you're tearing me apart yeah Yes, and that's what I said to him. I think you have to look at it in terms of, of the language of the film. Is the film, because he was like, the acting is so, well, and I, and it, how, and I said, it's iconic. And the, you've got to imagine that, you've got to enter into the language of that particular piece and see what those people were doing, what they were saying, and what acting had been oh, before. The acting. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing realistic about it. Nothing. The timeline is wonky. It's like, well, how long did this take? And, you know, then with it looks like it was in one day, but these three people kind of fall in love as a as a triad and have and make a little family. family. And, you know, it's yeah, it's I, I, yeah, I've said this for many, many years that it's basically even though they're not singing, it's an opera. Uh, you know, and also here's the thing. My belief is that all great work is camp. And I don't mean camp like, I don't think of camp as something that's throwaway, which I know what it means, you know, camp is, ah, super. I actually think that all great work is operatic, over the top in some way, um, iconic in itself, and goes to a level um, that is, James Cagney for me, who's the best actor ever, for me, still the greatest actor that ever lived. And um, as best, him and Betty Davis, still the best for me even though I admire so many people so hugely, for me, that consistency and the fact that they were both in their different ways. He's playing gangsters mostly, um, though notably, you know, was a former drag artist himself, et cetera, et cetera. But he is camp. The performance is operatic and, um, you know, and the the, the scripts give him that opportunity, you know, look, ma, top of the world, et cetera, et cetera. And um, they, and so I feel I feel like the greatest work, um, whether you, e- even when it's um, socially unacceptable now, like say Gone with the Wind, 
is, you know, it's, it's problematic to put it mildly. It's still, it's camp and it has this operatic feel that makes it an undeniable moment. And, I, I, and I'm not saying that your book is a kind of mapping of camp because I, I, I've, I've, again, I want to emphasize that I don't think camp is, I think that camp is fundamental. I think that Picasso is camp. I think that um, Mozart is camp. It's like they just go to another level where, where the other people would never dare go to. And they're prepared to go harder, faster, sweeter, stranger. They're prepared to go to the outer limits. And that's what I think makes a great piece of work. I think your work is camp. I hope mine is. Wow. That's a... That is a take on capital C camp that is new to me, and I will be chewing on that for days. Thank you. I'm tucking that away from I mean, you. Obviously, Valley of the Dolls is camp, but but so is Citizen Kane. So mm -hmm. so is almost every Betty Davis movie, and it's not her. It's the whole thing, the whole team that puts those the great ones, which are, you know the the which are many. Shakespeare is camp. Hamlet is camp. Romeo and Juliet is definitely camp. Midsummer Night's Dream, way, way over the top camp. So is Tempest, so is, you know, the ones that are weak are the ones that aren't camp. You know, how come we wrote Macbeth with the witches and the, the forest moving? And I mean, you can't get camper than that. Oh, oh, that's the power. I'm in South Africa and uh, they, they, we have um, these, uh, these load shedding incidents and all the power goes out. But, wow. for, but I'm in a house with a generator, so my, my key light, I put a light here so that I wouldn't disappear into the mist, uh, uh, has gone out. But we're still, wow. just, you know, they're up against it here in South Africa, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, have you read the, um, I want to ask you, have you, are you, are you reading, have you read the Paul McCartney book? The one that lyrics. No, Wait, no, it's actually it's 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 on my eye. Like every reader, I have a stack, but because I don't buy paper books, I'm just carrying them around on my iPad, <laughs> and it's on there. I am right now about a third through when Brooklyn was queer. That's what I'm right. That's what I'm reading right now. Oh wow! And the. And the the Sly Stone memoir is is on there. That might be next. And um, I have a stack. <laughs> Sly Stone. Yeah, I have a stack too. Interestingly, I bought Matthew Perry's book, even though I never liked Friends and never watched it. And because um, I knew it would be a very interesting examination of addiction and stuff. So, I mean, we're talking today on the day that it's been announced that he died. I saw your post about that. Um, the uh, as as I've said, I I I I said on a on a friend's post, he said something like, "Sometimes a celebrity dies and you're sad, but you're not surprised." And I, I said that. to him, "The last time I felt that was when Michael Jackson died." And people were like, "Oh my God, I can't believe it!" And every now and then, you know, I'd let them go, and then I, as they were breathing, I'd say. Honestly, though, did you ever really picture Michael Jackson as an old man? I, I, I was that surprised just, he hadn't died 10 years before. Exactly, exactly. Number one, there'd have been nothing left. He'd have simply excised his entire face. But you, you can't, I can't remember who was saying it, but the, oh, I think it was Elizabeth Ashley talking about, um, Oh, no, I'm never going to remember that actress's name. The 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 one who, who did um, the Marilyn Monroe role in The Star. She was a huge Broadway star. But anyway, the, the, the point was, you can't burn that bright that long. You can't. There's only so much. There's only so much energy. And Michael, there was no way he was not going to burn out. I'm surprised and, by Prince, though. Yeah, that took me by surprise. Even though it's but, obvious but now. But then again, he had he had issues that that he managed to keep private. So you know, we didn't know until after he was dead. We were like, oh, okay. 
you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like Elvis who was publicly fucked up. <laughs> or Whitney. Right. Whose, whose every fuck up was, was, uh, uh, Laid bad. uh was, was in the news. You couldn't, you, you couldn't not know about, about Whitney. Hmm. Anyway. The, uh, big, well, big paren. Well, these people are a conversation each, right? A, a long conversation each. But all of them, I put it to you because I'm obsessed now with camp. Uh, Prince was camp and, and a genius, there's no question. Michael was camp and, and, and again, a genius. Uh, Whitney was camp. The, you know, you, you've got to bring that operatic quality to me. And um, Orson Welles. Right now, Kenneth Branagh. Every time I see him, I think, my God, he's such a camp actor. You know, it, it's everything's like the moustache is this big, and the, and and you know, uh, he's just always. So I hugely enjoy watching him, even if the movie's terrible, because I know he's gonna. He's never. He's never not gonna give it to me. He's gonna. He's just gonna come out there. Is a diva. And of course, that's that's true of the saint herself. That's true of Garland. One hundred percent. No matter what piece of crap movie she's in, she's fresh. She's right now. You never, no matter how hackneyed the film is, she never is. So true. Never. I, 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 that's a really good point. These people, even the the true greats are always great, even if the piece, even if they're even if they're not great, like in in Mummy Dearest, where it's like, what is she doing? But, it's great. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, uh, the movie Mummy Dearest, obviously, with Faye Dunaway, where you're like, what is she doing with this performance? Have you, have you seen that wonderful episode of, um, of uh, oh, what's it called? Uh, at the Actors Studio. And they, you know, he, he goes through all their movies and their, their performances and then asks them to talk about it. And, and in her episode, they come to Mummy Dearest which, you know, which was, you know, she was excoriated for her performance. Um, and she said, that was my Kabuki performance. Ah. And again. I've actually used, I've used that term to describe certain performances. So that's interesting. The, so the, well, I really recommend you re read lyrics, the Paul McCartney. It's very, like I said, it's on my stack. Yeah, because he takes each song, you know what, you know the format. There's also a podcast where you can hear him talking about each song because of course it was all recorded. That's how they did the book. So they've turned it into a series of podcasts, which are fascinating. Um, I, you, I think you'll enjoy that enormously. Um, do you think he will do a book about music next? Songs? Uh, well, as I've said to every interviewer who is who has posited the and what next for Larry Duplichan, I'm really waiting to see if anybody gives a toss about this one. I there's wouldn't. really no there's for, for me again going back to show off. Um, to me, there is no incentive to writing a sequel to a flop. I disagree. So I disagree. Well, but, but but you're not writing. It's, I am. It's, it's not, it's no, but it's, it's it, it. We're not talking about your project. We're talking about me. True. I have I have no incentive to write a follow up to a book that isn't successful. But that's my point of saying I'm not going to paint done. anymore until someone buys one. I beg your pardon. That would be like Van Gogh, Van Gogh, Van Gogh, whatever, however you pronounce it. Him saying I'm not going to paint any more of these until someone buys one. No, it isn't, and I'll tell you why. Van Gogh was an artist and I'm an entertainer. And that's and those are two very different approaches. So I I I don't I don't I don't sing in the shower. Um I sing I sing for an audience. And if there's no audience, there's no performance. So mind you, I haven't yet decided what constitutes success for this book. All I'm saying is, unless I feel that it is one, I'll go do something else. I'll knit more, um, because I don't, I don't, I don't love the process of writing. 
So if I don't feel that's, which is why I'm 15 years between books. If I don't feel there was, if I don't feel there's a reason, I'm not just going to write stuff and throw it out into the world and think, gee, I hope your idea for the book that became movies that made me gay was so brilliant and on the nose that I really felt like I had no choice but to write that book. I almost didn't care whether anybody read it but me because I liked the idea that much. Um, and then when the um, when we started looking for people to endorse it and people I really respect, I think it was the Christopher Bram email where I went, oh, fuck, I've really written something good here um, because his entire email was an endorsement. So, you know. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I wrote this book. And if it doesn't sell another copy, I'm proud of it. Because I, from the front cover to the back cover, it's exactly the book I wanted to create. Magoyo's uh, drawing is exactly what I wanted. The John was amazing to work with and helped me um, refine the book into even more the book I wanted to write, but I, I, I won't write another book just to write another book. Well, in that statement, you managed to be as camp as I would wish anyone to be. If there is no audience, there is no- There is no show. performance. <laughs> you, may, you may quote me. If there is no audience, it's just a wank. If there's no audience, there's no performance. Well, there is an audience, I can tell you that for sure. There's me, and uh, <laughs> there's me. And also, I would say, I, 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 some of the greatest works of art really did have no audience at the time. And, uh, and, and, and you know this, and, uh, and I think that we have to have faith in ourselves as artists to go beyond the being popular and being fashionable. Uh, because iconic means you don't give a shit about that, and uh, and you are iconic. But that's but but that's but that's your that's your take on it. I yeah, don't of consider it myself is. iconic, and I don't consider myself an artist really. So if if I'm writing, and and it's the problem I had with all my novels is that I was writing pop literature that wasn't popular. And that was difficult for me. I had always wanted, I, I didn't write because I wanted to write the great American anything. I wanted to write the book that the gay guys sitting around the pool in Palm Springs were going to be reading in the spring. And I never did. Um, um, and frankly, no, no. I love the gay guys sitting around the pool in Palm Springs, but there's, there's more to, uh, to being an entertainer than that. Except I'm, that I am that guy. I get it. I get it. I get it. Obviously, I get it. And I, I respect your opinion. But of course, as a fan that hungers for your work, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I am a fanboy who, I am the classic nerd fanboy who, I'm running a company. I can ask my idols to do, to do something. You know, I am in that place. But the, um, but I, I, I'm also an artist and an entertainer. And it, 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 when we had to put our, I never actually put artist in my passport back in the day when you had to write occupation. Now you don't have to do that. And um, at least they're not in British passports. And, and but I, I, I had a good thing. What am I gonna put, you know? Entertainer is always what I'll go for. I'll always go for entertainer above all. So I, I'm with you on as far as you say that, but I do think that entertainment is art and often the greatest art was entertainment. Shakespeare was common entertainment. Dickens was common entertainment um, and so on and so forth. They were, you know, Sherlock Holmes, Arthur Conan Doyle stuff. It was all pot boiler with, with a million cliffhangers because it was serialized in newspapers. The Sistine Chapel was paid for. He, he didn't just think, I'll see what I'll, you know, he, had, he was asked to paint the chapel and then decided to make it incredibly gay. 
to the point where they were going to paint it over. But then somebody went, this is the Sistine Chapel. We can't paint over this. We look at what we're looking at here. Some, presumably, I'm going to say some queen in the, working at the Vatican went, okay, we'll seal it off so no one can look at it, but we're not painting over this. This is, this is, this is iconic, which it was. And, um, and that's why I say, you know, especially queer youth, we, there's, an, there's a sense of the iconic. And, uh, and so the work is, goes way beyond that initial response. If you're great, you know, if everyone loves you, you don't know enough, en enough people. You probably heard me say that in one of my Facebook posts. But, the, but the, there's, there's a price to pay for being truly iconic. And that is, in some form or other, loneliness. Prince. But I don't Lord. want everyone to love me, but I would like more. But I would, I, you know, I would, I would, I would like to have a success before I die. And what happens after that, I actually don't give a fuck. I mean, if you're uh, thinking about, oh, what will, you know, think of the future generations after you're molded in the grave. Frankly, I don't care. I want what I, I, I like being around. I get and, that. I get that. And, and here and, and, and hearing that one of my heroes read my books when he was a teenager. I had no idea. This is the I, thing though. This is the thing. You, you have to trust that when you're doing the work because I, I, I completely understand that. And I've had, uh, uh, I guess one of the things that's helped me is that I just decided that if it was an audience of one, it, me, it was gonna have, it was gonna be enough. I was going to have to put the work out there that I wanted to see. I was going to have to be the change I wanted to see in the world. I was going to have to be the good thing that happened to me every day. And I completely get that because, of course, I'm an entertainer. I perform as well. And, you know, and I, I love the audience. I love that response. It's never gone away. So I completely get what you're saying. But I, wanted, I want you to know, and I guess, you know, um, you were asking me when we were setting this up, why, you know, why, we, why did you want to interview me? And I said, well, I want to sell books, but more importantly, I want to talk to you. And, and, um, and one of the things I want to say to you is that you did, I've said it already in this conversation, but it can't be said enough, that what you did was so special to a million people who could never, ever, know how to get to you to say so you know this is pre pre, pre the internet um they just there was no i how was i ever going to speak to larry duplichon who i imagined to be of course you know sitting in some fabulous mansion writing his novels right and yeah i mean it never came over that way but the but still i just you mean you know you were up there as this writer and um and you know so it's taken how long ago is this, right? 40 years. And uh, for me to be able to get to you and say, Larry, you're iconic, your work is iconic. That book, those books, all of them were iconic. And, um, and, and, and that happens to me. People stop me in the street and say, I came to see a play once. There were three of us in the audience. You wrote the play, you were in the play, whatever. It was iconic. And it meant, and it's as you go through life, you start to realize, oh, it's not about the initial, the immediate response. People take away what you've given them and they carry it around in their back pocket as, as the way that some people carry a Bible, some people carry a love letter, some people carry a photo of a loved one or their dog with them because they look at that or they just know it's there and they know that this is one of the things that makes life worth living. And you have done that with your books, with your Facebook posts, with your very existence. And for you to not know that, to me, is um, something that should not be the case. You should, it, it's a crime that you don't know, that you, uh, that whether you think of yourself as an enter entertainer or not, what you actually are, is an artist, a diarist, a communicator, uh, a pioneer, uh, um, a, 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 an icon. And that what you've created is iconic and what you continue to create is iconic. 
the reason I wanted it to put you to put them into a book is because I wanted somewhere a place for people to go, a library of your, you know, your complicated, joyous, cantankerous, uh, sexy, uh, school mommy. All the different Larrys are in those. You know, there's so many Larrys, I can't list them all. The nerd, the 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 the, the muscle man, the, the 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 little the little gay boy, the choir singer. Oh, there's so many levels to you, and I don't. And you spoke for people who had no voice. And so, whether even if it was only one book, person who read that book, I can tell you that person, you saved their life. That is what I wanted to say to you. And that is why I was desperate for you to publish another book. So, I mean, I, I can't make you, you, no one can make you do anything. <laughs> and so, I can't make you publish any more books, but I can tell you now that there are people of all ages all over this world waiting to buy your book. Don't forget, people pass those books to each other. People go to libraries and read those books. Um, they, it, it's not about, it's not, a baby is not more loved if more people love that baby. All it has, to, all it needs is one person to love it, for it to be loved beyond imagination, beyond all limits. And that's what you did with your book. And I'm not the only one. Patrick felt the same way. And, um, and John, John grew up in, in, a, in, a, in a middle class suburb at public school, and he read your book and he was, when, you know, just after, that was just when he was leaving. And he read your book and it grabbed his heart. Patrick was growing up um, a, few, a few years later in, um, in Mississippi. He read your book and it told him that he, he deserved to be in the world. And I grew up in Bermondsey and um, in, in my family, a working class kid in, sl in slums, basically. And, uh, and I read your book. And I thought, this guy's writing the this this guy's this guy's doing it. We can do it. That's why you must write more books. It's not it's not about the applause. Sometimes people are too busy hugging themselves or crying or just staring open mouthed at what you're doing to applaud. You're a showstopper, Larry. And with that, I should end this. Um, and Which means, of course, we, we need to do a series. We, have, oh, yes. we still haven't talked about That's the movie. That's so obvious. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm going to instigate a series of conversations with you because um, I think there's so much to talk about. We didn't even get to. I mean, and actually, who's done that? The conversation between... Um, somebody who's written a book and somebody who adapted the book and had to pull it apart and and um, you're so honest about it and I'm, I'm thrilled that I get to be the one again who 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 uh, to you know be the the platform in which you can say this is what they did to my book and uh, you know I think that's a fascinating conversation again isn't it because both of us it's challenging for both of us you know, that process is challenging for both of us. So maybe maybe that's a conversation between me, you and Patrick. We'll see. Ooh. Yeah, I'm, conversations I'm, I'm that people that. should have, right? Because, you know, we've never, I've, I've never talked about it with Patrick. I've never talked to him about the movie. After, the, after I saw the movie for the first time at the, um, uh, at the premiere, I said to him, what what I've said for the past uh, seven years, which is, I think it's a nice little movie, but I don't think it's a very good movie of my book. And then I went home. 
I mean, yeah, it's very interesting. Well, see, I can start talking about it now, but we need a whole thing. We can't. We can't talk about it now. Yes. But the, <laughs> we um, yes. And, and I think all of your, I know some of your opinions, but not all of them. And I think they're all justified and all fascinating. And they, I would love for them to be aired because it, that, the movie is a, is a, is a amalgam of so me, Patrick, you, all of these three people, as I said, in these different parts of the world, having um, have this strange connection of stuff and of, of um, autobiographies. Because obviously, obviously, you can see that Patrick's biography, autobiography is in there, change of the place, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a great conversation for us to have. But there's so many, I now need to cook up a thing where we talk about many works of art. And, and so we can have these diverse opinions about them. And, uh, and, and sometimes yeah, they're intersecting. But I'm gonna let you and people who are watching this go. I'm gonna place this on social media, just as simple as that. And um, if that's okay with you, uh, sure. you know, you're gonna, uh, I know, I guess we should put it on YouTube as well, and put it on Facebook and just see who finds it. And again, we may get six views, but I think there'll be the right six people. And, uh, and certainly I'm just so, so thrilled to actually see you and hear your voice. And I can't wait till we meet in person because that's going to be, you know, we're going to have fun. And uh, that will be iconic. But thank you. This was this, this. This has been great. I can't I can't wait for the next one. I haven't even gotten to talk about how much Stonewall means to me, which is which is another whole thing we have to talk about. Yes, um, that, but because I can tell you the stories behind that film, there's a lot that's to a tell. very That's a very important movie for me. So we need to talk about that. Me too. And also, and it's in light of the, have you, have you seen the second one? Just this year, I finally decided, oh, okay, I might as well watch that one. Here's the thing. Well, there's a lot to talk about, but I'll just say this as a teaser for the conversation that we must have and record about that movie. Um, it's a remake of our movie. It's not just another movie about Stonewall. It's, I, for me, everyone kept saying to me, you should, you, you, have you watched it yet? Because it's a remake of your movie. And I, when I watched it, I was like, oh, it's literally in sometimes scene for scene. I posted about it after I saw it and I said something very similar to that. Yeah. I mean, I was is. like, you know, I was like, this character is that character. This yeah. character is an awful lot like that character. And like, it's like, yeah. wow, okay, that's interesting. Hmm. Well, that may be partly okay. because I pulled some real people and, and, and fictionalized them. But also, I think I think that the filmmaker, who's it, Roland Emmerich, I think he watched yeah. Stonewall when he was younger and wanted to remake that movie, but make it his own. And so I think it's a fascinating thing to talk about because actually there's a couple of moments I think are better than mine. Script wise, I'm talking about scripts now. Um, mm -hmm. But the um, but but mostly every mistake, everything they tried to get me to do, I, I, I was in an unusual position when I got to do that film. Our, our filmmaker was dying, and so uh, right. I, and so we had, were in a very short time time, and they they got another writer um, for a year because they, they I got fired after a week, and then it came back to me after a year. And at that point, I had absolute power as a script writer because they were desperate and they, they hadn't found another writer. And so I could get all this stuff about drag queens being the lead characters, which they did not want, et cetera. Et cetera. Oh. Yes, Roland made the movie that, that they tried to make, get me to make. So I actually really sympathize with that film. I understand what happened and why people, they made those choices because I was asked to make all those choices. Make it, wow. about, make it about the cis het guy, make it about the straight guy. They wanted it to be a straight lead and so on and so forth. And I, I absolutely fought like a tiger because I was young and arrogant. Um, and, and I didn't want to write myself out of my own fucking history book. The, uh, you know, the, the, we're not writing the queers out this story. That's not happening. So it was a fascinating, but I, there's so many details and layers to all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely another, uh, another hour. Yeah. So we have to do one about the making of Blackbird. We have to do the one about um, Stonewall. There's so much to talk about. We have to do one about mahogany. The list goes on. Indeed. <laughs> um, I want to thank you again for writing the, the, a book that surpassed my already very high expectations and hopes. 
And I want to thank you for being you and that, that you are so you and you're never afraid to disagree and you're never afraid to, to be you. That's, again, iconic and what makes you glorious and um, and I'm just so happy you're in the world and that I got to, to meet you and I can't wait to be side by side with you um, hugging and arguing. See you soon, Larry. Bye.